Uh, there we go. So yeah, I was just saying um, before this meeting started that I was feeling quite tired and perhaps I should just give a, a talk on being tired. And then I remembered that Ajahn Brahm did exactly that about a couple of years ago and it was a really boring talk in my perception, <laughs> all about being tired. So I thought, I'll try to spare you. I'll try not to do that. Um, but as I was saying, um, I had a couple of themes in my mind, one about expecting the unexpected, because that seems to be the theme of my life at the moment. And the other one about um, combining the practice of loving kindness with the practice of breath meditation. And the reason I wanted to touch on that is because I did have to cancel a new year retreat that I was due to teach on that theme. And it was a three day retreat. So something I really look forward to, and I know a lot of people had registered for, and it was going to go in depth about how we can use the meta practice as a sort of precursor, if you like, or, or maybe you can just call it something that enhances the breath meditation. Uh, because these two in combination can be very powerful and very beautiful. Um, and it's the way I practice a lot as well. So it's always nice to speak from one's own meditation practice. Um, and so I thought I'd touch on that a little bit as well today. And uh, also just bringing in, you know, these uncertainties of life and how we can use meta to help with that as well. So since it's a talk on expecting the unexpected, I think uh, I'm going to just keep talking and we'll have the meditation a bit after that. Is that OK with everyone? Normally we start with the meditation and then uh, we, I give a little Dhamma talk. But today I think the theme will kind of uh, hopefully run into the meditation in terms of almost being like an, a little bit of guidance in the talk itself and a little bit of instruction for your practice, which of course you're always free to take up or leave as you wish, you know, whatever you find helpful for you, because it can change from day to day. We can't expect anything and we certainly can't expect our minds to be the same from one moment to the next. So something that worked yesterday might not work today. Something that worked for you this morning might not be what's needed right now. And really, all we ever have is this moment to deal with, isn't it? And I don't really like the word deal with. I think we have this moment to meet and make peace with. And this moment is always different. Which moment? This moment. Which one? This one. This one. It's, it's changing. Jum, 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 jum. All the time. And so the reason I um, wanted to talk about the unexpected was partly because I have, uh, after a long time, decided to uh, take some time off and go to the US for a retreat with one of my very dear teachers. It's not Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't get to Australia, but America seemed like another really good option. And uh, so I'd already booked a ticket to California. And then I realized that it was going to be too much of an ask for my physically and mentally tired being at this moment to get all that way. So I decided to just instead uh, go straight to Massachusetts where the retreat was to take place. And so I was very happy with that plan. And I decided to stay a couple of months uh, to really resource myself and to actually do two retreats with the same teacher so I was going to give myself a double treat uh, a retreat and um, so I was very happy booking the flights I'd just been told the retreat was going ahead and then the day after I booked them I got a message urgent attention it looks very likely highly likely that the retreat will be cancelled both retreats because they were with the same teacher and uh, he's in Canada and I think the instructions for the Canadians now are to not travel unless it's absolutely essential and not to the US and so Anne-Marie is yeah confirming that she's in Canada and so everything's off and this is the second time I've tried to book, book tickets to America and at this stage yeah when I heard that news it was before going to bed and I thought okay Never mind, I'll sleep and see how I feel tomorrow. And I woke up feeling really kind of numb, like no matter what I do, no matter how I try to look after myself, and the best laid plans and all this, and it just doesn't work. So I went around the morning feeling kind of numb and feeling like just kind of hopeless and giving up. And, uh, and then by the evening, I had a chat with a friend and um, 
she reminded me that one of the things I've been missing of late is this sense of being able to really listen into my intuition and just get a sense of living in the moment and not having any agenda. Because even a retreat can be an agenda. It can be an agenda to feel a certain way, to deepen our practice for the sake of da da da. Yes, it might be for very good reason. It might be for serving the project or for my own liberation. But we always want something out of out of everything we do. And I just realized that having that agenda was setting myself up for trouble because there were expectations attached to that. And the Buddha said, whatever you expect it to be, it will always be something different. And isn't this really the theme of these whole couple of years? We could have never conceived of it happening. Sometimes I go into town, you know, the other day um, with the people who are hosting me here, we walked into town. They wanted to show me the market where I'm hopefully would like to go on arms round once the weather improves, as in not this year, but in the summer, perhaps. And everyone was wearing masks. And, you know, there's this thing about, oh, nice mask. Oh, I like the little dragonflies on your mask. And I thought, isn't this extraordinary? I mean, a couple of years ago. If somebody would have heard that conversation, they'd have thought, what on earth are people talking about? Like, what could have led to that kind of conversation? You know, fill in the gaps. And I don't think we could have conceived of being in this situation. In one way, it's incredibly challenging. And I can look at it from a negative perspective and say, if it wasn't for the pandemic, we have we would have our monastery now. I would be getting fed every day. You know, I would have a community of wonderful people like yourselves living closer by or at least being able to come and visit without fearing for your safety or for mine. And yet this isn't the way it's been. And something else has happened instead. One of the beautiful things, of course, is this Zoom group, you know, because we wouldn't have had these online teachings and this opportunity to grow together through them. And for myself as well, to feel that I'm able to serve in a very meaningful way in a time of crisis and difficulty. And so that has been a beautiful gift. And yet still the tendency of my mind is to think, what next? What do I need? And, you know, it made me wonder, we can think we know what we need and what's good for us, but do we really know? Do we ever really know? Most of that is just based on what's worked in the past or what we think should be good for us or even what we think a nun should do. And after talking to this friend who has some insights into my patterns, you know, in life about giving a lot, giving a lot and um, sometimes sort of bending the way I show up in the world to please others and to do the right thing. She said, what about, you know, this um, 20 year old who went off to India and just followed her intuition with no agendas, with no um, destination? You know, I had an open ended ticket to India and to Thailand. So it ended actually, it ended in Thailand, not in England. And for years, all my tickets would, would always end in Asia, not in England. England was a, always a return trip. And that led to me having the opportunity to live the holy life. You know, that led to the most incredible gift that I could have ever, could have never imagined, right? Could have never asked for. And so we really don't know. And something in me now feels like a little flame has relit or been rekindled, feeling that, yeah, let me just go with the wind. Let me just go and see where things lead. They might lead me to monasteries. They might lead me to retreat situations where I can be alone for some time. They might lead me to new supporters. Who knows? But when we have that, um, rather than an expectation that's fixed and that can easily be shattered, we have a hope. We have a hope not for getting a certain outcome, but just a hope in the sense that life will give us opportunities to grow. Life will give us a chance to learn in whatever way that presents itself. And of course, sometimes, you know, the lessons that are there to learn might seem beyond us. They might seem too difficult. And I'm not saying that every difficult situation is necessarily a good thing. Sometimes, you know, things may traumatize or really wear us down. But even this can be an invitation to us to take better care of ourselves and our choices and um, the way we relate to life. So keeping an open heart to life is part of loving kindness. You know, keeping an open heart to the possibilities life can present is much better than losing hope. It's better than losing trust. And not trust that things will go the way we want them to, but trust in our good intentions. 
trust that we, if we have these wholesome intentions to try to use the, li- the opportunities life brings to grow and to cultivate wholesome states of mind, even wholesome states with the difficult states of mind, a wholesome relationship to them, then we have a chance to grow. In fact, can we really ever lose? You know, physically we can, physically we can get sick, our bodies break down, we become tired, maybe relationships that we cherish change or break up. But, you know, some of those things are also just kept together through unwholesome habits. You know, we're in relationships that are codependent or where one partner is not valued or the other wants you to change. And so even when we go through difficulties in life, I think it's so important to keep that open heart and to look at the future with loving kindness rather than with fear. Yeah, because much of worry is just looking at the future through the eyes of negativity, looking at the future with fault-finding eyes rather than with open eyes, with a, a sense of curiosity, a sense of being willing to let the future unfold, let things unfold, rather than make them happen the way we wish. And that's, of course, impossible, always, but especially now. So this intention of metta is not always about, you know, being compassionate, being full of loving kindness towards others, but also being full of loving kindness towards ourselves and towards whatever we're experiencing. Even I think we can be compassionate and develop loving kindness towards the situation. Because sometimes in my role, I'm not sure, you know, is it me that needs the loving kindness? Is it, you know, my supporters that need loving kindness? Uh, Who is it that's really in most need right now? And sometimes it's the situation. A situation can be frustrating and it's nobody's fault. You know, the situation that I've landed in over here where there isn't a lot of support, or at least it hasn't grown yet to the level necessary to maintain even a small monastery, Um, things just haven't come together. The causes and conditions were sort of, in a sense, they are coming together, but they're being interrupted too. There are other, you know, variables that we can't predict. So is that really anybody's fault? Do we blame it on the virus? Do we blame it on the borders being closed? You know, because certainly the borders to Australia are one of the things that give me my little uh, respite and my chance to deepen the practice under really, really good supportive conditions. So instead, I kind of think about developing loving kindness to the situation that we're in. It's a lot less personal and it's a lot more inclusive, expansive. Perhaps it has the seeds of wisdom. Understanding causes and conditions are so complex and we really can't, um, we don't have that much control. We don't have that much influence. You know, we can just try our best to put good causes in place, but there will always be others that come along. You know, the Buddha said there are various reasons for things to happen. Some are past karma, our own or other people's karma, their actions in the past coming to fruition now in certain ways, but also things like weather, things like accidents, and of course, disease. Yeah. So this is just part and parcel of existence of being a human being of being subject to old age suffering and death yeah to being part of a a fragile ecosystem that of course greed and you know consumerism has has further destabilized but it was always subject to uh decline to destruction to dissolving this is part of uh how the world cycles go and so this loving kindness is not only about taking care of ourselves. And I was quite touched when I, I wrote a Facebook post recently and said, you know, that I've been giving a lot uh, of energy out teaching. And I realize now that the supportive conditions are just not enough to enable me to carry on with that. You know, there needs to be something underneath me. The basic needs need to be covered, you know the requisite of having a suitable place to stay that's suitable for a monastic. So that means a place where I can um, observe all my vinaya rules, not to have to cook for myself, not to have to, um, you know, uh, do a lot of admin, for example, and manage the project. All these kind of conditions that would free up my time to really meditate deeply and have um, more of my energy free to teach and to share. 
And so some of the responses, everybody's response was so, so sweet. You know, they were all like, wow, we're really inspired that you're taking this time. And it really helps us to uh, take that time for ourselves because all of us here push ourselves too hard. You know, this is part of the world we live in, especially in kind of capitalist societies. It's hard work making a living to survive. And we have this tendency to give a lot and to overwork and to stay up too late, you know, to the point where we don't even know until it's too late that we're already exhausted. And so everyone was very, very kind and compassionate and saying, I'm really glad you're taking this time to care for yourself. And I thought, yeah, that's really true. Self-care is an important thing. And yet it's not always the only solution. It's not always the best solution because sometimes we need the care of others. We need to learn to receive care, you know, if our role in life is to serve others and then once we're tired to serve ourselves, it's another thing to do, isn't it? You know, either you're serving another person or you're looking after yourself. Who's looking after you? So can we really learn to ask for what we need and learn to receive that care? Because we're human beings, we're relational beings and we exist through reciprocity, reciprocal kindness and support. And that's the beauty of establishing things like a bhikkhuni sangha or a bhikkhu sangha. It thrives on reciprocal care. Yeah. The monastics have more of a duty of the spiritual care, the nurturing, the counseling, the um, example that they provide. And the lay community have the responsibility, if you like, the um, role of also taking those teachings to heart and practicing them and also developing that generosity and providing the sangha with their material needs and in this way the whole community grow together in their various ways and of course everybody has the chance to do both you know I wasn't always a monastic once I was a lay person maybe you won't all be lay people at some point you might be monastics or you might live a lifestyle that's similar to a monastic lifestyle simplifying your life giving more time to the practice. And you can only do that if you have your requisites in place, if there are others caring for you. And this is how we survive, this is how we live. We don't live in isolation. So I did want to talk a little bit about how we can care for ourselves, because of course this is very important and no one else can do that for us. And we have to know what we need, yeah? So the things that, is it really the things that make us feel good? Is it the things that we can indulge in or are they the things that are going to support us to grow on the path? Of course, two of them might be the same, yeah? But what are the things that really resource and sustain us? And for me, I was thinking it is things like being in nature, you know, because sometimes there's not another being to care for me, but I can feel cared for by the trees. I can feel cared for by nature herself, you know? In Oxford, I used to often go to this beautiful little park near my home. It was only 10 minutes walk. And I would just sit on the roots of these incredibly beautiful beech trees. And I got to know those trees. You know, I got to know when they were about to like have their first little green leaves. Well, actually they were sort of red from the start because they were copper beeches. And uh, one of them would come into leaf first and the next one about a month later, which was really extraordinary. And then you got to see them through the seasons and you got to see those red rusty leaf colours changing into um, autumnal colours, going back into oranges and yellows and then falling on the ground. And those trees were just so mighty and so, so stable and solid and reliable, you know, so much more than anything else around me that was changing all the time. And so I really took refuge in that nature. And also in exercise, exercise is something very important that we can do for ourselves. Getting enough uh, endorphins running through the body, yeah? Getting everything recharged and energized. And also um, natural light. I was just reading about how natural light is so important to get the chemicals like serotonin um, being produced in the brain and also a healthy diet of course you know no pro not too much processed food um things with a lot of omega i think it's omegas in them lots of nutrition as best we can um 
and there's natural light. So in the winter time, you know, of course, there's not very much light over here in the UK, but you can always get one of those little lamps that's like um, it helps with seasonal affective disorder. It gives you this extra um, ultraviolet, I guess. I'm not quite sure what what the mechanism is, but it really works. And so I sit in front of that a little bit every day. And then things like in the relational field, you know, asking, as I said, for what we need, being honest, having honest conversations, not only hanging around people just for fun or just for entertainment or even, you know, just to perform your usual social role, but to say, you know, this is how I'm feeling right now. And I don't know about you. Do you feel like this sometime? And just reaching out to others, yeah, to share from the heart. And I think that's so important. And it's what I try to do here with the group, because I don't think anybody appreciates somebody who's just, you know, showing a front and saying, yeah, I'm fine. Meditation makes you always happy, 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 you know, great. I mean, we can be happy even when we're down, right? We can be happy because we're in touch with the real meaning of our lives. But it's not the same as always having an upbeat mood. Sometimes we can feel a little bit low, a little bit sad. And why should we stigmatize that? You know, by giving ourselves permission to feel what we feel, we unconsciously give that permission to others too. And they feel that, you know, you don't have to say, yeah, that's fine if you're sad too. By just being real, being yourself and being at ease with your emotional world, other people instinctively feel that they can be at ease with their own emotional world around you. And that is an incredible support for both because so much of isolation and loneliness comes when we forget that we all go through very, very, very similar emotional um, changes, emotional moods, and not all at the same time, you know? Sometimes someone's very strong, very um, strong. By strong, I mean energetic, energized, yeah? Because you can be sad, you can be vulnerable and be very strong if you're able to show that vulnerability. There's an enormous strength in that. You know, gentleness is an enormous strength. Somebody in our sitter class last week, said that uh, when they feel anger, they notice that it's a kind of emotional armor that they put up around their heart. And I thought that was so insightful and so uh, honest and brave to share that because it is, it does take much more courage to show that you're afraid, to show that you're sad, to show that you're scared. No. So why is it that we think we've got to show up a certain way to prove how tough we are and how resilient we are? Perhaps real resilience is actually learning to be okay with, at ease with, welcoming, even embracing all of our emotional moods. No? And I think that can really give us courage that no matter what we face, we're not going to desert ourselves. Yeah, Other people may or may not be there for us, but we are not going to desert ourselves. And so when we practice this loving kindness, it's not about putting on a sticking plaster onto a wound. You know, I tried that from time to time, not intentionally. I thought I was doing this properly. But during my raise retreat, I also had some like some emotions that were like doubting whether this project would work out and feeling kind of a lot of a feeling of needing to be with monastics and just not being able to get over to Perth, you know? So this despair and this loneliness would sometimes arise. And I was trying my best to practice loving kindness towards it, which seems very good, yes, if we have like some suffering, we practice loving kindness. But then I realized that actually there was an agenda in that to make myself feel better. And I'm not saying we shouldn't feel better, but we have to be so careful about where we're coming from when we, practice in this way because the loving kindness is not a certain feeling the loving kindness is an intention first and foremost an intention to meet ourselves right where we are you know it's not loving kindness so that I will be happy it's loving kindness that truly wishes may I be happy and may I be happy as I am right now not in the future. So it's opening our heart to whatever is arising in the moment. And it was really when I almost dropped the loving kindness and just perhaps practiced it at a deeper level by really touching into those emotions that were sometimes a little bit scary. 
and just staying with them without wishing them to leave, wishing them to change in any way, just really going into them with all the kindness and tenderness. That was where the shift happened. And it wasn't an agenda so that the shift would happen. Yeah. The mind is so tricky and it's such a subtle thing even to talk like this because we can still pick it up as a tool to get a better, better feeling. <laughs> but the compassion and the wisdom comes from meeting things as they are. So that's already a talk in and of itself. So maybe I should do the meta with the breath another time or maybe we can just practice it together as we sit. Um, but I wanted to start anyway by using that loving kindness to just meet whatever's arising within us. And if pleasant experiences, pleasant feelings arise, well and good. If they don't, it's fine. It's just as well and good. Yeah, joy may arise, joy may not arise. We have equal compassion and loving kindness to both. But one of the qualities of this loving kindness when we are able to, um, to really incline our lives with those intentions, even starting off with our thought patterns, at least generating thoughts of loving kindness, even if we're not feeling it, then that loving kindness will start to overcome the hindrances of things like fear or anger or disappointment. Yeah, it will give us more resilience. And as a result, when we practice loving kindness at the beginning of our meditation, we are um, softening and even overcoming those coarser defilements so that when the breath comes to mind, we're already into the beautiful breath. We're already meeting the breath with a feeling of joy, with a feeling of rapture. And this is the fourth stage of the, actually the fifth stage of the Anapana Sati Sutta which I was going to read out. We almost need a part two of this talk, I think. <laughs> but um, the first four stages, just in brief, I like to notice the breath coming in and out and long or short. And uh, yeah, let me go to the text itself just briefly. So one understands that when one is breathing in long, one understands I breathe in long and the same for breathing in short. And then one experiences the whole body of the breath, the whole length of the breath. And then one chains, I will breathe in tranquilizing the bodily formation, which means really calming the breath, yeah? Because it's that breath that is um, described here as one of the bodies within the bodies by the Buddha. So he's talking about the whole breath and then tranquilizing the whole breath. But then in the next um, tetrad, steps five to eight, the Buddha talks about, I shall breathe in experiencing rapture. And the word there is piti, piti patisambedi asasisami tisikati. It means breathing in a short breath, I'm aware, that breathing in a short breath with rapture, breathing in a long breath with rapture. And then breathing in experiencing pleasure, sukha patisambedi, it means um, the, the happiness starts to come into the mind and suffuses the breath. So these are really emotions that come from the mind, but they sort of are experienced in the object. Whatever object we're aware of becomes suffused with those emotions. And the breath appears beautiful. The breath appears delightful. And when something's delightful, we tend to value it. We tend to feel that it's important to us and we want to stay with it. So at this point, it's like the glue, Ajahn Brahm uses this lovely phrase, I think in Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond, he says it's like the glue that sticks your awareness to the breath, this piti and this sukha, this happiness. And so the metta practice is also of the nature to generate eventually this piti sukha, the happiness and rapture in the mind. And so quite often when I practice breath meditation, I do a lot of loving kindness first. So that by the time the breath arises in the mind, there's already this feeling of delight. And the breath already appears, not necessarily delightful or blissful, but certainly something quite subtly pleasant, something that's fairly easy to be with. And this is where the preliminary practices are so, so helpful. So you're not fighting that breath. 
you know, actually able to embrace it just as you've embraced yourself, just as you've embraced your own sadness, your own fear. Now you can embrace this breath with all its own little kind of insecurities about whether you're going to like it or not, whether you're going to try to control it or not. The little breath is also now seen almost like a being in your mind. And so the breath comes in and you experience it as something pleasant, something beautiful and something that you want to be gentle towards. Yeah, Something you want to uh, welcome into the mind and allow to do its thing. It's like if your friend comes to visit you, you want them to feel so relaxed that they spontaneously start talking about whatever they feel inclined to discuss. You know, you want them to feel at home and go and get themselves a cup of tea if they wish. So in the same way, we want to invite the breath in and trust the breath to just open itself up to us. So all we have to do is be present with it, present for it. And then we watch and see where it goes without that expectation without an agenda that by watching this breath, I'll get calm. By watching this breath, I'm going to start getting nimitters in the mind. Other people get nimitters. It's my turn now. <laughs> we don't have this kind of agenda to the breath. It's just a pure, open, non-controlling relationship that we have with this breath through the power of our practice of loving kindness. And after that, then... Um, the Buddha says that we breathe in experiencing the mental formation. That's citta sankara, um, patisamvedi. So we experience um, the mental formation. And in this case, it really means uh, the mental experience of that piti and sukha. So piti sukha, although it's a vedana, it's part of vedananapasana, the um, satipatthana of uh, observing feeling, if you like, or experience. It's now being felt more and more but as a mental quality. So even though some of these sensations arise in the body, here it's arising, of course, together with the breath, Vedana is always a mental quality. It's part of the uh, chitta, it's part of the mind. And so we start experiencing um, the way the mind interprets the breath. And we're moving in this way from the physical realm into more of the mental realm. And then the last one in this particular section is that I shall breathe in tranquilizing the mental formation. And again, that means tranquilizing the PT and sukha. So the PT sukha starts to calm down. Yeah. And none of this is, you know, an act of will. This is just something that happens almost when we've had our fill. So it's like by allowing those emotions, just as we try to allow the more afflictive, difficult emotions we also have to learn to allow these pleasant emotions too and allow them to do their thing without withdrawing without trying to like push them along because sometimes you know we don't necessarily leap towards the pleasure in meditation sometimes we're quite suspicious of it and we want to hold back and we or we think we're not ready for it yet but even these experiences are to be met again with that loving kindness that really is impartial and it's able to just welcome and embrace whatever's arising in the mind. So this loving kindness can really help when we get to these steps in meditation on the breath. And sometimes if you are practicing with the breath for a long time and you're staying with the in-breath and the out-breath and you've been with the in-breath and the out-breath and your samadhi is quite good, but you're getting kind of bored because it's not developing, it's not becoming pleasant. It could be because you haven't developed enough loving kindness in your life. There's not enough of a sense of well-being. Because loving kindness, if you think about it, is so connected to virtue, the foundation of the path. Loving kindness is a very pure and wholesome motivation that is part of virtue. That is almost the, um, the attitude behind virtue. It's what motivates us to live a beautiful, virtuous, kind life. Mm -hmm. If you have a mind of loving kindness, it's not possible to intentionally use words or deeds that harm another. Of course, we'll slip up. And sometimes our words might be perfectly skillful, but the other person will be triggered because of something in them, some kind of past trauma or something that reminds them of your mother or something of their mother or somebody who was difficult in their life. And so they take it in a way it's not intended. But if you have that loving kindness, you know, you are purifying your mind. And even though you'll make mistakes and things won't always go your way, 
at least you know you have this pure conscience that yes I've done my best I've done what is good and there's no need for me to feel there's no need for me to punish myself by not allowing myself the joy of meditation and not allowing myself you know just the meditation that I have right Sometimes we think, I don't want this meditation. I want a better meditation. But why can't we be happy with the one we have? Can we allow ourselves to have an average meditation <laughs> or a rubbish meditation? Of course, there's no such thing, but we judge these things. huh? We really judge them. So with that said, it could be another whole talk on Metta and the Breath because it was to be a three-day retreat, but at least you got a little taste and uh, we'll do some meditation together. So, please do take a couple of minutes to stretch, to stand up, to find a better chair or posture if you need one. And we'll sit for about half an hour. So since metta is the orientation of this practice, see if you can give yourself another cushion <laughs> or a shawl or dim the light, anything. Another sip of tea to establish a wholesome relationship with your body and mind so that your body knows you're a friend. One of the things I notice about people who practiced a lot and who are really at peace is that they're so at ease with themselves. In any situation, they're so at ease. Whether they give a good talk or a boring talk, <laughs> whether they're hot or cold, tired or energized, they're at ease. There's wisdom in that. Whatever you experience is simply a product of everything that's gone before. Nothing to blame. No one to blame at all. So with our eyes closed, we can gently establish mindfulness. Allowing the sensations to come into sharper relief, receiving any sensations that you experience in your body as you're sitting. And intentionally meeting them with kindly eyes. as though drenching your awareness with kindness. Warm acceptance. Open. 
openness, curiosity. However you experience kindness. When you know it's kindness, when it puts you a little bit more at ease. Perhaps you notice your shoulders just dropping slightly. Your brow relaxing. Your jaw loosening up. Perhaps that kindness is expressed by loosening some clothing or giving your ankles a little more space, straightening up. Perhaps as part of that kindness, there's a feeling of gratitude. Gratitude towards your body. Towards yourself. For offering yourself this opportunity for peace. A gift of loving kindness, an act of self-care. Maybe you can receive a gift of loving kindness from the others in this room. Tuning in to that sense of group support. Knowing that you're held in a field of loving kindness. You don't have to do it all alone. You're not the only one who cares for yourself. Ah, what a relief to have each other. I'd like to invite you, if you wish, to tune in to any sensations, any feelings that are pleasant or neutral.
and offer yourself some words of loving kindness, whatever resonates for you. Such as may I be happy. May I be free. May I be healed. May I be at peace. You may have a particular wish for yourself that feels very true and genuine, sincere right now. Let's see what that is. And sincerely offer this wish with an open heart, listening in the silence between each phrase to allow your heart, your mind to follow in that direction, to tune into the resonance of that pure and beautiful intention and trust the mind to follow, trust the heart to open to loving kindness. Just receiving your own good wishes without trying to make anything happen. Without looking for any particular result.
if you find your mind is a little bit scattered or full of thinking, you might want to repeat those phrases fairly regularly without much space between them. Or if your mind is quieter, or as it becomes more peaceful, more still, you might drop down to a single phrase, or perhaps just a key word to keep your mind inclining towards those beautiful tensions of love. Perhaps even combining them with the breath. If that comes naturally to you. Regarding that breath with eyes of loving kindness, as though the breath were a very dear friend. A friend who perhaps doesn't visit you very often. But when they do, you take extra care. You really want to be present for your friend, the breath.
And if you think you know the breath, listen in a little more closely. Are you aware of subtle peace and delight in the breath? the simplicity of a single breath. Allowing that breath to suffuse and satisfy the mind.
So we're coming close to the end of the meditation. But you will keep breathing, I hope. You always have the opportunity to make peace with the breath. To send the breath some loving kindness, some care. Notice the effect of kindness on your experience. How does kindness feel? What is the experience of peace? Even for the moment, how does peace feel? Uh, maintaining a sense of connection to your body, to the embodied experience of kindness, of peace. You can gently open your eyes when you're ready to end the meditation. Staying embodied if you can. <clears throat> Keeping some of that peace inside. Ah, can we do another one? <laughs> Actually, I am giving another talk on Tuesday for the Gaia House community. I think my co-hosts probably have figured out the link. So if anyone wants to join that um, on Tuesday, it'll probably be a very similar theme, but it'll probably come out a bit differently. <laughs> but I'd like to also practice combining kindness with the breath. There we go. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah. Because it's quite a nice practice, I, I find. I don't know, how was that for you? Any comments in the chat? Any questions you'd like to ask or experiences that you'd like to share? Um, for those on my retreat, on this session, we do ask directly. So if you prefer to write it, that's fine. If you want to ask a question, you can raise your virtual hand. Your voice is going to be on the recording, but not your face. It's, I take all the bugs, as Ajahn Brahm says. The one who has their face in the front of the car gets all the, actually it's the windscreen that gets all the bugs. So I guess I'm the windscreen. <laughs> and my co-hosts are very brave as well, because they have a go and so, uh, saying this and that from time to time. It's amazing because they didn't used to want to, but now they're really good. <laughs> well, it seems like there's some chats. Had to stop as I was nodding. Oh, just keep nodding. It's okay. It's all right. Feeling more peaceful now. Yeah. Sometimes the body just has to go through that dullness. That seems to be the body, yeah, going through that. And uh, it's like the brain turns off a little bit because huh? <laughs> you're tired. And, uh, 
afterwards you feel better you're right Minori I, I maybe shouldn't have mentioned that because we want people to come to the online sitting as well so yes this is only a one-off at Gaia House I'm just doing that this week it'll be the same as tonight pretty much so I would suggest you go to the Tuesday meditation sit because the Gaia House is a different group yeah, the Tuesday sit is there as well. Okay. Oh, Joel said the talk really changed his mood. I'm presuming for the better, <laughs> whatever that is, or at least it's a change. <laughs> it shows us our moods can change. Change my mood too, actually. Very nourishing meditation. Thank you. Two questions. Can I ask if your teacher is Sharon Salzberg? No, no. Um, I mean, you can ask. <laughs> um, no, I haven't really learned from Sharon Salzberg. I've never met her. I have read her little book about Metta, but that's not where I learned Metta. I learned Metta from Burma. I think one of her teachers, Upandita, was also a Burmese teacher. So that particular way of um, practicing and teaching metta is very it's from the Burmese tradition so we'll all put our own sort of expression to it but it's a very um, traditional way it's from the Visuddhimagga actually not one of the Pali canon texts but a later commentary and in there they break down the the metta meditation into the different categories of being so i think there's actually five but i tend to combine the first two because it's the benefactor and the teacher and then the loved one um but often that's one and the same it can be one and the same and not everyone has a teacher or a benefactor or someone they can relate to in that way so it's just a person that's very easy to develop that loving kindness towards and then the um, person that you're fairly indifferent to, that maybe you haven't noticed very much. It's almost like the person you don't really take any notice of uh, because probably they don't serve you in a particular way. And then, uh, oh, sorry, it's the self, isn't it? Often it's the self first, but in the West, I think it works better to do the loved and the benefactor first and then the self. Whenever you do the self, you can do the self, you know, anytime uh and then also the difficult person or the person we have difficulties with which could change from time to time so uh but I, i'm pretty sure the formulation will be very similar as to the way sharon salzberg does it i think i emphasize as my own teacher does actually brown is my main teacher um the listening in the space between the phrases uh because i think that's really important to just get a sense of the resonance of a thought or of an intention because sometimes we just say these things almost like words and we're not really connected to the meaning or we are kept connected to the meaning but we don't really embody where that meaning or where that those words are pointing to we have to embody that meta embody that loving kindness and really get a sense of how thoughts affect our emotional world so I find that quite interesting. And it's almost like giving that meta time to grow rather than just, you know, consistently saying the words. And some people don't use phrases at all. So some people have a very visual uh, mind and they can just imagine a person in front of them, get a sort of felt sense or maybe a visual sense of that person and just kind of tap into a mood or an emotion of meta and, and sort of generate that outward, perhaps through their sensations, imagining those like vibrations or emotions of meta, like exuding outward to cover that person. But I think having a phrase in from time to time, for me anyway, helps keep the mind directed the right way, helps sort of just nudge my mind in that direction. And the deeper I go, the less often I need to drop those phrases in. So that tends to be how I practice. Can I say what is the time of the meditation? Yes, if you join at seven for 7.15, that's UK time. I think you're actually only four hours behind, isn't it now? Yeah. Or are you in Toronto? No, five hours, is it? Okay, right. Okay, there's another question in the box. I'll just go to it. Um, well, I think metta is the magic bullet that's able to take meditation to a different level or depth. I'm working on it at the beginner level. Yay, we're all beginners. You know, every time we sit down, we begin again. 
So that's wonderful. I also think it's incredibly helpful because the main hindrance most of us have, I mean, all of us are going to have it, craving and aversion, right? But especially aversion, I mean, it's much more the damaging of all the hindrances in a sense. I mean, the craving is in a way deeper and subtler, but it has a pleasantness to it. So we don't always notice it there, but aversion, it's more immediately destructive and harmful. So I think, you know, and often also we have aversion to ourselves. We also can have aversion to our meditation. And so it's almost, you know, using meta is like working at all those different levels. And also it has that added ingredient of the happiness, which is so key to the path into samadhi states at least. Yeah. So, so I agree completely. I think metta is so important, not to mention that it's the, you know, most wholesome, one of the most wholesome motivations you can have towards the whole world. Yeah. So you're working at the level of intention there and from intention comes right speech, right action, right livelihood, etc. The other parts of the path. So metta is incredible and it's not just a beginner's practice. Um, it's not just a sort of uh, superfluous or sort of a decorative practice on top of the real meditation. It's actually, it's working with perception. You know, the Buddha says in the, um, oh, which sutta is that? It's in the Diganikaya. Is it Pasadika Sutta? I forget, but he says in one sutta that you could almost see that meditation as a training in perception. The whole of the path is like a training in perception because until the hindrances are really fully removed, our perceptions are always, you know, bent in some way. They're not seeing things as they truly are. So we train our perception in wholesome ways um, to free the mind from those hindrances. And, um, and then we learn that perception too is conditioned. So it's actually a wisdom practice as well. We can see how those states of metta themselves are conditioned. And how, you know, our state of mind basically determines how we see the world. There is no objective reality out there in the world. It's not that, you know, as I was saying before, this situation is a good one, that one's a bad one. It's really how we relate to it and what we do with it, how we use the situations in life that we get. Of course, we influence them as much as we can to be, you know, agreeable to us. But um, we use them in whatever way we can to learn and to grow on the path. So meta helps with that as well helps to show us how conditioned the way we see things really is. So shall we come to? Uh, I will ask Kate to unmute. Hi. Hi, Kate. Um, I find that when I focus on the breath, I get quite tight in my chest. Yeah. And, and it almost feels like it's feeling a bit of anxiety, even though I yeah. don't feel I have... I didn't, didn't feel I was coming to this session with anxiety, mm -hmm. but it just feels like I can't get enough air in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. If yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it makes, so, makes a lot of sense. I think um, the link between the focusing and the anxiety is just that. I think it's the fact that you're focusing on the breath that could be creating the tightness. So rather than see it as your mind going out and looking at the breath, you know, or focusing on the breath, perhaps see it more as the breath coming to visit you and you're receiving the breath. So taking yourself out of an active role and more into a passive role, more like as though the mind is like a sponge, the mind is very loose, the mind is very expansive, and then the breath is kind of coming into the mind and soaking into the mind. So it's a much gentler, softer experience. And if you are practicing some of the metta beforehand and softening the mind, that helps make the mind more spongy, more receptive, so that when the breath comes to you, you there'll be no, there'll be much less need to focus on it. It will come when it's ready to come. In the meantime, you're just tilling the soil. You're just preparing the uh, foundations for the breath to enter in. So when the breath comes, it feels welcome. It feels that. You know, you're not staring it down. You're just receiving it very kindly and it might stay. The other thing that could be happening is that um, as your mind is becoming perhaps more focused on its own, um, then you're getting in touch with some of the deeper emotions that are in there that you're not always aware of, you know, that maybe need that little bit of care and attention. So it's bringing those to light and it's not a bad thing. 
it's not that I didn't have anxiety now I do it's more that the anxiety was probably there and there were other things covering it over you know the things that we have to put on there just to get through our day um I mean I think anxiety is a global experience at the moment I'd be surprised if it wasn't and it's definitely reflected in you know all the reports of depression and anxiety rates really shooting up so yeah I'd be very surprised if most of us aren't holding some of that and so it's a really good thing you know sometimes they come up when the environment is safe enough for them to to feel for you to feel them so it's all good it's all good but I would say probably just be that little bit more gentle because that's something I'm still working on you know it's always a little bit more gentle than I imagine it to be Lovely. Thanks so much. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> I'll ask Mandy to unmute. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was <laughs> very pleasant. Um, okay. My uh, question is during a guided meditation, um, are we are we able to get into the second absorption it's up to you i don't know are you <laughs> or will like if you're listening yeah so... well i mean that's a, that's a kind of yeah i mean there are different definitions of what the jhana states are so i mean i'm guessing by absorption you're using that to uh describe what some teachers call jhana Yes. And different teachers call different things jhanas. <laughs> so the way I understand it from my teachers and from the suttas, um, even in the first jhana, sound is, is not present. Sound is not present at all. So if you're still hearing, you're not in an absorption state. But okay. it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, it, it's not really important what we call these experiences. I think yeah. what's more important is that you're just generally seeing that the mind is learning how to follow in the direction of peace. Okay. And so you're just using perception in a way that tunes into subtler and subtler um, levels of peace, if you like, yeah. um, and that the mind is calming. Yeah. So, I mean, for some people, they are able to sort of follow a guided meditation. And if they've done a lot of practice in meditation, at some point, the words might just sort of start to fade away, drift away. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, they won't hear it because they'll be getting into deep meditation. But even hearing can go a long, well, maybe not a very long time, but it can go before you're actually in a jhana. So... It doesn't really matter what you call those states. You know, the hearing, all perception in the senses can change quite a lot when we're in meditation. So, you know, sometimes the body seems to fade away as well uh, to different degrees, yeah. but you're not yet in a deep meditation. It's like you're on the way, <laughs> yeah. but it's, it's just a sort of trajectory rather than necessarily a sudden stage that you enter into. So, but but if you do get into a really deep meditation, it's it you'll know about it. It's it's very clear. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that helps a little bit. Yeah. Cool. And also, sound can disturb those deep meditations. So even if you get into a deep meditation, either during a you know a guided meditation or maybe even in a noisy place, um, you can be brought out of it through sound when the sound com turns back on or if there's a loud noise and the meditation is not very very stable then sound will bring you out so. we're almost at nine o'clock i think i have to give um who's going to give a little derek would derek like to say a few words you have to interrupt me and tell me because i might sometimes forget to invite you so <laughs> I don't think I can do that. I don't get <laughs> No, I understand. <laughs> but I, I do want to thank you very much for, I found a very inspiring talk and very oh. insightful talk. And um, also for being with us, even though you're in deep need of a rest. <laughs> oh. So thank you very much for that. And I think today is the third day in a row that you've been with us, even our group. So it's really... Oh. 
we're really lucky and really <laughs> grateful for your presence. Mm -hmm. And while we are able to hopefully participate in our group as well by supporting Venerable Chanda's needs and also the project to, to build a monastery for us all to be part of. So if at all possible, we'd be really grateful if you were able to donate anything you're feeling able to donate for the project and to help us all as a big community to continue to be here each time together again and practicing the Dharma together. So thank you very much for any help you're able to give. I just have one other announcement and that is that next Friday, there is currently on the calendar a Suta discussion group on the 24th. But being Christmas Eve, I'm sure you can imagine that this might not happen, <laughs> this won't happen. And um, there is gonna be a chanting together on Wednesday evening, but no Suta discussion on Friday evening. Okay, thank you very much and <laughs> hope you will have a very good week. Thank you so much, Derek. Thank you very much. Yeah, gosh, it's amazing. I mean, I didn't really realize I've been with the group for three days running, but it's it's nourishing for me too. Definitely. That's why I want my energies to be freed up for the teaching, because it's definitely the bit I enjoy. And uh, sometimes it's also very resourcing for me to sit and practice with people and to share the Dhamma. You know, it's the most important thing in life. <laughs> definitely the best kind of conversation we can be having I think is about the practice and how it applies to our life so thank you all for giving me the opportunity and uh yeah I'm glad you made the announcement about Christmas Eve because I was thinking to change my mind but I really do need to take a rest <laughs> even though I love to you know share the Dhamma it, it would be good uh to have that evening free so I will see you anyone on Tuesday who wishes to come otherwise Matthias will be holding the Tuesday sitting and I hope you will attend because it's a really lovely space and uh, yeah I was there last week for the first one there were about 21 people I was amazed and that was just from the retreat that we did so um, hopefully it will keep growing uh, and it's just for these groups at the moment so the link is not to be shared publicly at all for security reasons so but you will have the link in the box and I shall see you on Wednesday I hope so please take care and have a lovely Christmas if I don't see any of you again for a while. I'll see you in the new year, but uh, have a really good Christmas. And, you know, don't give yourself too many expectations because sometimes it's not a pleasant time of year for many people, especially if there are family difficulties or maybe loss of loved ones or whatever it is you might be going through. It can be heightened by any kind of expectation and it is just another day so celebrate it if you can and if that feels good for you but you know if you can't celebrate that day celebrate another day it doesn't matter when you enjoy your day <laughs> so do something nice for yourself whenever you can and do something good for each other as well so let's unmute you and we can uh, wave goodbye <laughs>